610 Market Street is now Lake. Hello. Today's lesson from Study Sync is about Hurricane Harvey. Now, if you're watching this in 2020 during our COVID-19 shutdown, and you're one of my eighth graders, then you were a sixth grader during Hurricane Harvey, and probably remember what it was like. I'm going to read this thing to you from Study Sync. You should have already looked at the questions, because instead of reading the questions, I'm just going to refer to them when I find their answers in the passage. Okay? There are a couple things that I'm going to mention right now. In the study sync packet, there's a graphic that shows some record rainfalls. It has a big water drop on it. Well, the interesting thing is right here it says Avon, Texas. There is no Avon, Texas. That's supposed to be Alvin, Texas. So that's a typo. And then there's a chart right here that says there were 62. The death toll for Harvey was 62. But here in the article, it says 80. So who knows? This article talks about two brothers, Liam and Declan, or Declan, yes, Declan Connor, who, when the storm was approaching, their parents weren't real worried, but they went down to Galveston. The boy had a little flat bottom boat and he brought it back because he didn't want to get smashed up in the storm. And they bought a bunch of snacks and stuff too. So even though their parents weren't particularly worried, their house had flooded before. They rebuilt their house up on stilts. And so perhaps that's why they weren't too worried. And, but the boys are like, yeah, I don't know. I'm going to get my boat and bring it back. And while I write it, let's get some snacks. Okay, so I'll read. And when I get to something that is an answer to a question, I'll just mention it, elaborate a little bit, and hopefully you'll remember that when you answer the quiz. Okay? On Sunday, August 26, 2017, the night before the worst of Hurricane Harvey struck Houston, Texas, Liam Connor and his brother Declan stayed in to watch a boxing match with their friends. The school year had only just begun. Their friends were saying that the hurricane might get them a day or two out of class. One of the questions, question number two, asks you, is this in first person or, sec or third person? Is it in past tense or present tense? Well, we can see some verbs here. They stayed in. They were saying. He saw that it was raining. He went to the garage. He heard stuff floating around. Is that present tense or past tense? Also, first person or third person? Is this being told by Liam Connor or by Declan Connor? Or is it a third person telling a story about what happened to them and what they did? in the past. Paragraph 2. Paragraph 2 has the answer to question number 1. Liam and Declan's parents didn't think Harvey would be as bad as the Memorial Day flood two years earlier. That one had ruined their home, but they hoped the elevated house they'd rebuilt would be okay this time. Still, the clan, Liam, and a couple of friends had traveled south days before to retrieve the clan's boat from Galveston, and the brothers had stuck up on water, stocked up on water and snacks just in case. So, that's the answer to question number one. Uh, the clan and his friends took the threat more seriously than his parents did. Liam woke around 6 a.m. on Sunday morning. Now that's redundant. 6 a.m. means it was in the morning. 
they should have said Liam woke up around 6 Sunday morning or around 6 a.m. on Sunday. You don't need both of them. From his bedroom window, he saw, past tense, that it was raining hard. He went to the garage and heard stuff floating around. He ran upstairs to wake the rest of his family. And Thursday, August 24th, I'm sorry, there's a part way at the bottom. Hurricane Harvey turned out to be much worse than anyone expected. Between Wednesday, August 23rd and Thursday, August 24th, it morphed from a tropical storm into a Category 1 hurricane as it glided toward the Gulf of Mexico. Morph means it changed. At 2 p.m. on Friday, it was a Category 3 hurricane. And they only go up to Category 5. Category 3 means the winds are up to 129 miles an hour. Just four hours later, it had grown to a Category 4. By the time, time Harvey had made a sustained landfall in southeast Texas, it returned to a tropical storm. Sustained landfall means it, it hit land and stayed there. See, sometimes hurricanes come in and leave. Sometimes they hit and will back out. This one came and then sat there above Houston. And that was the problem. It was The winds were down, but it was raining. And it sat over Houston and rained and rained and rained. It refused to dissipate. Dissipate means to go away, to disappear. Question number three. And the sheer amount of rainfall it caused was devastating. So sustained means it goes on for a long time. Dissipate means to go away, to disappear. And sheer just means an incredible amount. Then there's a chart about the different wind speeds. Uh, uh, tropical storm means the winds are less than 74 miles an hour. Think about a car on the freeway going at 70. You know, think about now a wind blowing like that. Well, this had gotten up to a hurricane uh, category 4 with winds up to 156 miles an hour. According to the Weather Channel, the aerial coverage of locations, the area covered, this is aerial, not like aerial like an airplane, but aerial like area. The area covered locations picking up at least 20 inches of rain was greater than, was bigger than the state of West Virginia. So Hurricane was putting 20 inches of rain over an area bigger than the state of West Virginia. And then the area that was getting 40 inches of rain, now picture 40 inches of rain, it's almost two feet of rain, was bigger than the state of Delaware. August 2017, Hurricane Harvey made landfall on the coast of Texas. It was not only one of the most powerful storms to ever hit the United States, it was also one of the most destructive. Days of historic rain and devastating floods. How do we comprehend a storm like this? Hurricane Harvey is hard to put in perspective. It forces us to make some pretty strange comparisons. Harvey dropped an estimated 27 trillion gallons of rain, and that's been compared to a cube with 2.8 mile sides, a giant raindrop floating over Manhattan, four Great Salt Lakes, or 65 weeks of Niagara's Horseshoe Falls pouring over Texas, or roughly the equivalent of 40,882,455 Olympic swimming pools. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't picture that many swimming pools. Entire communities were completely flooded. In Nederland, Texas, the rainfall exceeded 60 inches over the course of a week, which is the highest total ever recorded after a storm in the United States. And of course, the problem is there's no place for that rain to go. We've got so many buildings, so much of ground covered in pavement, that there's no place for the water to go. The streets flood because they're designed to channel the water away from your house. Unfortunately, they didn't have anywhere to go. Uh, Harvey led to more than 80 deaths. Texas Governor Greg Abbott estimated damages between 150 and 180 billion dollars. While the Center for Business and Economic Research at Ball State University estimated it to be 200 billion dollars. There's another little chart here. I'm not interested in it. The economic ramifications are staggering. So 
economic ramifications means what impact, that's what ramifications are, what impact did it have on our economy? Because not only destroying homes, but destroying businesses and closing businesses. There's also long-term emotional and psychological effects in the aftermath of a natural disaster like Her Harvey. Studies conducted following Hurricane Katrina, for instance, showed a sharp rise in depression, anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Now they call it post-traumatic stress syndrome, but then give the abbreviation PTSD, which is for disorder. I wonder if now they don't use disorder anymore because it sounds so negative and now it's just a syndrome. I don't know. In 2008, the Nature Journal concluded that a year after Katrina and months after originally interviewing survivors, there's a 6% increase in interviewees experiencing PTSD symptoms. The death of a loved one or reliving unpleasant memories from the hurricane accounted for much of that increase. Still, many affected by Katrina were especially shaken after being displaced from their homes, which caused the loss of a sense of routine or normalcy. Though the, though the precise numbers might never be known, Hurricane Harvey also displaced tens of thousands from their homes. I helped uh, clean up some people's houses, and one couple, their daughter was away at college, and her room got flooded, and it was her, her high school yearbooks were ruined, she had photo albums that were ruined, and things that could not be replaced. The next page has another chart, this is the one about different rainfalls. Uh, if you don't know much about the 1900 storm in Galveston, you should research it. If you've ever been down to Galveston, you know there's a seawall, and it drops off that wall, it's about 20 feet high. In 1900 and before, the seawall, the water, the Galveston Island, was sea level. Once this big storm came in, they raised up all the buildings. They put in some boardwalks for sidewalks. They started pumping in dirt from Galveston Bay, and they raised the level of Galveston so that this end was 20 feet higher than it was after the big storm came through. And so as storms come in, it hits this wall, and bounces back rather than wiping out the whole town like it did. Um, and you can read those. All right, so now it jumps to the two boys again. The boys hadn't planned on using the clan's boat. They brought it from Galveston to keep it from being lost or damaged in the hurricane, not to motor it down the streets of their neighborhood. That Sunday morning, however, helicopters whirred overhead and neighbors cried for help from nearby rooftops. A neighbor asked Declan and Liam if he and his wife could be taken on the boat to the local Kroger, which was located on higher ground. The boys' parents were nervous about letting them go. Cars in the area were submerged. Tree limbs and other debris choked the waters. Their current was powerful. You see, there's a lot of dangerous stuff going on in there, some risks that are going to be in their way. But people needed help, so Liam and Declan's parents allowed them to head out. Two friends, Thomas Edwards and Richard Dickinson, joined them. Declan was a freshman in high school, three grades below the other boys, but he steered the boat. When we were driving through the street, it was really nerve-wracking, he said. There were cars underwater, and you can't see that, or the fire hydrants. When they reached the local Kroger, the boys fully realized the seriousness of the situation. Entire families had narrowly escaped the flooding. They gathered in the parking lot with their pets, and whatever belongings they could scrounge together. Police officers were everywhere, trying to control the chaos. From that point onwards, the boys' mission was to bring as many people to safety as they possibly could. That mission wasn't easy. For one, the teens had the only boat in sight, which means they were overwhelmed with requests. They had to prioritize. Prioritize means to decide who's more important or which situation is more uh, immediately needing rescue. People over pets. Rescue people before you rescue pets. Though they rescued plenty of animals too. And they paid special attention to anyone whose life was in immediate danger. Every time we rescued somebody, there was somebody down the street screaming, please come back and rescue us. Of course, we had to say yes, Liam said. 
This is question five. Sometimes the boys had to convince the individuals they were attempting to help to hop on board. Some skeptical neighbors, skeptical means like, yeah, what is this? Some neighbors were skeptical. They even asked if the foursome was just joy riding around for fun. A lot of people were in disbelief to see people pulling up to their houses in a boat, Thomas said. Some of them were reluctant. That means they were hesitating. I guess because they were waiting for the Coast Guard or actual rescue personnel to come, not four teenage boys in basketball shirts with their shorts on. They were surprised to be rescued by teenagers and not by professionals. Police officers were doing their best at the local Kroger, but they had little other than rafts. After the four boys had proven themselves, law enforcement asked them for guidance. It was just really funny. The fire department was basically taking orders from us, Thomas said. They were like, you all know where to go? Where should we do? What should we do? The clan was kind of bossing them around. This next paragraph answers question seven. In the early afternoon, a photojournalist from the Houston Chronicle spotted the teens and took a ride in their boat. He snapped pictures and video that quickly spread on Twitter, social media. Thomas took advantage of the newfound fame and tweeted out Decline's phone number. The power of social media was quickly evident. Phone calls and texts bombarded Decline, and not just from people in Texas. People were calling me from California, Decline said. People were calling from everywhere, saying, I know this person that lives there. They really need help. Can you please help them? Sometimes social media can be a quick and powerful communication tool. Question seven. Then there's that chart that shows the different places and how much rain had fallen. Oh, here's question number four. Though the teens use technology to identify neighbors in need, their methods for rescuing were more old-fashioned. The can's boat was only supposed to hold three or four people, but sometimes there were as many as 13 people on it. To reduce the weight, Thomas and Liam rode on a paddleboard tied to the back. Even though he was a swimmer and water polo player, Liam struggled to keep up with the strong current. Foul-smelling garbage littered the water, and fire ants stung his exposed skin. That's some of the risks they faced. You know, a boat that only holds a certain number of people, then being in the water where there's fire ants, fire ants will find things to float onto, and sometimes they'll make their own islands they cling to themselves. And if you're in the water and they come toward you, they climb onto you and then bite you. So they faced a lot of risks in the water. Question number four. At one point in the day, the boys found two older city workers who had gone out the previous night in their dump truck to rescue others. The dump truck had flooded and neither worker could swim. They had been clinging to tree branches for hours. It wasn't easy, but Liam was able to paddle to the tree branch, drag the workers onto the paddleboard and transport them back to the boat. I think that was one of our most memorable rescues because they went from being really upset and scared to being really happy, Liam said. In total, the boys rescued several dozen people, too many for them to count. And then we jump to the conclusion. As the floodwaters dissipated, the boys continued to make themselves available. The next day, Liam, Thomas, and Richard patrolled the neighborhood with an axe in case anyone was stuck in a home. Later in the week, the boys, they would use the axe, people would. Some people were like, they'd gotten into their attic to stay out of the water, and they were trapped there. And so they actually had to chop through the roofs to get into the attics. Later in the week, the boys teamed up with Thomas's dad to help neighborhoods affected by flooding. Strake Jesuit High School where the boys attend school, set up a Facebook page to coordinate additional volunteer work. It was one of those life-changing moments where it was just crazy to see everybody helping out and how nice and kind everyone was, Liam said. The teens' lives have returned to a sense of normalcy, though. Thomas admits, whenever I drive around Liam's neighborhood and whenever I turn down one of the streets, I remember, oh wow, all of this was underwater. Despite the national attention the boys received, they say they haven't been treated any differently by peers or neighbors. 
and they aren't seeking recognition. As Liam put it, I know this is cliche to say, but all of us think that we're not heroes. We were just lucky to have a boat, and we didn't deserve any of the credit that we got. I think anyone in our neighborhood would have done that, would have done what we did. So that's the passage, and as I read it, I stopped and talked about questions with the exception of questions 9 and 10. 9 is the question about who said what, and you can flip back and find that. And number 10 is just putting things in order. So, if you have any questions, you can email them to me. You can put them in the comments below. And if not, go and take your quiz and make 100. All right, see you next time.